What's going on, everyone? You know, we're about to start this thing right now, I believe. Uh, we just want to welcome everybody today. Um, first and foremost, uh, this is an interesting conversation that started off uh, very sporadically, and you're going to learn about that in the midst of this um, this live feed today. Um, the title, if no one has not um, got the yet of this conversation that we're going to have today, um, is COVID-19, um, vaccines, and Black medicine debunked. Uh, what we know now versus the Tuskegee experiment. Um, you know, we're just gonna, you know, just have a nice time as Martin Lawrence say, just to kind of wrap a taste. <laughs> we're just gonna converse about just some, um, just the whole, you know, pandemic and just some de debunk some myths that we've heard and just get some people who have some um, real insight about the actual um, conversation that, you know, we've been fed through the media outlets. I um, mean, it's good to get some kind of, you know, tangible um, information from some people that would kind of just enlighten us and kind of give us a little bit more clarity in the midst of all the confusion that we got going on right now. So uh, let me just first start off with the purpose of this conversation as well. Uh, we're going to foster a critical conversation centered on African Americans and the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we also want to provide the audience, um, like yourself, uh, with a historical and medicinal understanding of the Black body, viruses, and disease. And we also want to create a safe and inclusive space to discuss the pros and the cons of, vaccine, of the vaccines and the dark medical history for African Americans. Um, I just want to start off by introducing myself. As you can see, my name is Corey Dinkins. Um, I am currently a simulation technician at the Nell H. Woodruff School of Nursing at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I also just want to introduce the lovely panel that you see um, in this conversation with me. Um, they're going to be the enlightenments. I'm just going to be the one kind of uh, handling, uh, handling the mic. But uh, we first and foremost have Layla Brown Vincent. Um, and she is, let me correct myself, Dr. <laughs> Layla Brown Vincent. Uh, she's currently an assistant professor of Africana Studies at UMass Boston and currently also a visiting research fellow at Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study. Um, if we had the <laughs> hand clap, I would definitely tell everybody to give herself a hand clap. Um, we also have um, Dr. Kendra Richardson. She is a primary care physician at the Charlotte VA. Also, uh, we have in the conversation Dana M. A. Gant. Um, she is currently a PhD candidate in integrated biosciences at North Carolina Central University, great school. Uh, we also have Ray, excuse me, Raja Malika Rahim, um, a Maryland Yarborough Fellow at Kenyon College and a PhD candidate in history at the University of Florida. Gator Nation, chop it up. Um, so now I just kind of want to start, you know, I feel like I've chopped it up a little bit. Um, you know, everybody's heard my voice enough. Um, just kind of, I want to kind of start off with seeing what um, the panelists have to bring to the conversation. So um, let's start off with, uh, actually, let's start off from the historical standpoint. Um, I would actually like to start off with, um, with Raja um, or Layla probably would work. <laughs> I think they're the historians in the building, but um, tell me about your background and just actually kind of let me know, like, you know, um, what you can bring to the conversation today. Go ahead, take yourself mm -hmm. off me. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Yes, um, thank you all for tuning in and I'll get started. Um, and what brings us here, right? This panel actually started off of an Instagram post um, that said the COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, and the experience that we're living is not the Tuskegee experiment. Um, and that was a profound post because since the uh, release of the vaccine and its announcement, and since we've known the effect of the pandemic on the African-American community, there has been a lot of conversation um, about the Tuskegee experiment and its effect and its devastating history um, that it had on the African-American community. Um, and we wanted to center a conversation to debunk the myth, to provide understanding um, about the Tuskegee experiment experiment, um, how it came about, and how it's not different today. So that is my perspective. Um, I'm working on my PhD, as you stated, in history. I focus in African-American history, and that is particularly one of the topics 
that I bring out to my students when talking about the African-American experience, I make sure to talk about the Tuskegee experience, make connections to health and to reshape that narrative. And I hope to do that today. That's pretty awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Layla, um, from a global perspective, I think you could actually um, add as well to the conversation. Um, please tell me um, what you can bring to this conversation um, and with your expertise. Okay. Um, so again, uh, I echo Raja's sentiments. Thanks everyone for tuning in. This is a very important conversation. Um, I would like to say that I'm not a historian. I'm an anthropologist. Um, I'm a sociocultural and political anthropologist. Um, and honestly, so my, my interests and in sort of what I bring to the table is um, thinking about our relationship to the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of global response in relationship to social economic systems of the world and the sort of politics of, of what is happening with the, with the COVID-19 crisis. I think that it is a very important conversation to have to understand that while the sort of COVID-19 vaccine trials are not the Tuskegee in, uh, experiment per se, there is a very long sorted history of Black experimentation um, in the sort of American medical establishment, the Amer American medical complex. But even beyond that, I mean, I'm currently based in Johannesburg, South Africa, and skepticism about the, about the vaccine is high here as well. And so I, I bring to this conversation some, I hope to give some sort of contextualization and some reasons for us to take seriously Black skepticism about the vaccine in this moment. I love it. I'm totally excited to hear all your um, insight, um, especially from a global perspective as well too. Um, um, the vaccine definitely is something I'm really trying to figure out. Um, heard a lot of myths and stuff like that. So I know Dana uh, can probably give us some insight on that as well too. Dana, what would you be able to bring to the conversation as well? Um, so from a scientific standpoint, well, not just from a scientific standpoint. So let me back up. Before I um, came back to school to get my PhD, I was actually a clinical research coordinator. So um, I understand how clinical trials are conducted um, I understand the um, process of informed consent. Um, I know that one of the questions um, that a lot of people have, which we'll get to later, um, is how the vaccine was developed so quickly. Um, so I understand the scientific aspect of that. And um, so just being able to mesh the clinical trials aspect plus the scientific aspect, um, the difference between this COVID vaccine and other vaccines, how this is, um, how once you get the vaccine, they aren't giving you COVID. Um, so kind of like going back to what Layla and Raja were saying, debunking the myth of, you know, the whole um, American medical um, notion of, you know, black people, you know, being um, misrepresented in clinical trials and things like that. Um, and really understanding the, the vaccine. Um, so yeah, just, just the science behind it all and how the vaccines work and the clinical trials aspect of everything. Okay, I'm definitely looking forward to your insight. Um, and um, Dr. Richardson, I'm telling you, like you, you on the front. So I mean, you, you <laughs> I mean, please, you know, let me know what you bring to the conversation because like, you know, I'm, and all these media outlets are telling me it's crazy where you're at. So I know you definitely can provide some insight on your, uh, with your background. Yeah, again, I uh, echo everyone. Thank you for joining. And thank you all for having me and thinking about me on this uh, much needed topic. Um, so ultimately as a medical physician, a medical provider, I'm going to really bring to the conversation just medical knowledge of what coronavirus is in general, um, how it affects us um, as a community and as people of color, and as well as talk about, um, not swaying you to take the vaccine or not the vaccine, but just how in general vaccines do protect us as a community as a whole. Um, I will, uh, discuss some questions about, um, the vaccine, um, what we need to get to herd immunity and what that means and what that is, and as well as taking the vaccines with comorbid conditions, um, in particular when it revolves around pregnancy and fertility. Um, I do work at the VA, so I'm not at the hospital aspect, um, but I am in the clinics. Uh, so I do 
um, empathize with some of my colleagues who are in the emergency department and in the intensive care units. I know their they their lives are a lot harder than mine at this point, and I do want to thank them for being selfless and offering the care for us. Um, so I can definitely discuss it more from a medical outpatient standpoint. Thank you, thank you. Well, let's just go ahead and jump into the conversation now, uh, Raj. I know you were, um, had mentioned. Um, the Tuskegee experiment. And that's, you know, kind of having me a little leery about like the current situation that we going on, uh, that's going on right now in the world. You know, they're talking about like, you know, the disbursement of like the vaccines. Um, I know personally someone very close to me who actually got the vaccine today, uh, who's in the medical field, but like, you know, I'm definitely looking at um, their symptoms, you know, related um, to like, you know, post the vaccine. Um, so, because I'm just kind of, you know, worried about, you know, or anxious just about getting the vaccine because all the, the timeline and stuff like that. So, I mean, could you kind of just, you know, give like, I know everybody hears about, you know, the background of the Tuskegee, Tuskegee and stuff like that. Could you actually just kind of enlighten us about, you know, the Tuskegee um, experiment, like let us know like what kind of, in a nutshell, what really happened? Yeah, and I will definitely keep it short um, and kind of give you all the version I give to my class, um, to my students, and then point you all to the necessary resources for additional readings later. Um, but what we need to understand uh, about the Tuskegee experiment, this experiment started in 1932. Um, it was a public health uh, service initiative. Um, it was funded by the government. It was at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. The official name given to this particular study was the Tuskegee Study of the Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. Um, and what came about and ultimately what started as an experiment or a medical trial to the general public or to these individuals, to the 400 men uh, who, African-American men who actually had syphilis. It actually started out as a trial um, during this time period on the national scale scale. Um, during this time of the 19, building up into the early 30s, we see in the 1920s, there's a focus on health. Syphilis is a disease of that time period, and there's various treatments using mercury and other methods that are failing. Um, and so researchers, the scientists of the time are looking to conduct studies. And it's not just happening in Tuskegee, um, it's happening in other places. But the Tuskegee experiment becomes so profound because it takes um, over 50 years for this experiment to become public knowledge um, in which we understand now that African-American males were not getting the proper treatment. They were in essence lied to. Um, they were giving a placebo um, for some of the trial. And even when the vax, or excuse me, when the cure for syphilis came about, which is penicillin, if I'm not mistaken, you know, um, this is what the history tells us. I will let the medical experts dive into how penicillin and syphilis will work. Um, but when they came up with the, uh, excuse me, with the cure with penicillin, they still did not treat these men with the penic uh, with penicillin. They actually wanted to see and study the long-term effects on of syphilis on the African American body, particularly the male body. And so when it comes out. Uh, in the 19, early 1970s. Of course, we're understanding the 1970s at the different time period from the 1930s. Um, and there's a lot more attention. The civil rights movement is uh, trend, has transitioned into black power. There's more information. And so kind of understanding, debunking that myth, understanding 1932 when this study takes place is in Alabama. Um, they target sharecroppers. These are African-American men tied to land. Most of them are not educated. Most of them are, you know, two generations or so removed from slavery. So the ideas of reading and writing and having the information and being able to read and digest and ask the necessary questions um, was not available to them or nor did they have the means on their own. And that's part of the difference today when we're thinking about how we can understand the COVID vaccine. We have the knowledge, we have the resources, we um, have uh, 
fellow panelists like uh, Dr. Richardson and Dana that is, can share this knowledge that you can go to, you can ask these questions um, about this particular virus. And, you know, a lot of this conversation about the Tuskegee experiment is tied up in race and as a racist experiment. And yes, in many ways it was, but when we dive into looking at who were involved, we understand as in the research that has been done on the vaccine today, that there are black doctors and nurses who are working um, in the labs and who are researchers who help produce the vaccine. In the same way it was in the Tuskegee experiment, there were black doctors and black nurses involved who had their own role not to take the blame, but they did what they were uh, what their job was at the time. And so I tell my students, it um, do not judge the past with a 21st century mindset. I totally understand that because like, you know, my parents are very timid um, to, you know, even look into anything in regards to, uh, you know, the vaccine right now because they're just kind of scared because, you know, they're you know, their parents, you know, with the wisdom came to them with the Tuskegee experiment. Um, and they're just like, you know, I'm kind of timid. I kind of want to wait. But, you know, just like you said, with the research that we have right now, it's just something that, you know, we kind of just have to look into as well, too. Um, but we also like are kind of fed like, you know, like with, with the media, they're telling us like, um, well, you know, you need to do this right now. We're seeing the rush and we're just like, well, you know, just like you said, like, you know, back in the 30s, you know, we were we were somewhat kind of like, you know, at a disadvantage, you know, we, we, were, we were not at a disadvantage, we were, we had like, um, we had our we were sharecroppers and stuff like that, but it just seems like now we're educated and it's like, are they trying to, you know, come against us and like, you know, put something in us that's not research and stuff like that. So that's what sometimes, you know, I look at it as well personally, but, you know, I, I'm open to, um, you know, more knowledge, like you said, but um, one thing about the media um, I kind of want to go into, and that's what I, I would like to see if Layla can kind of chime in, because like you actually get to see the media uh, from outside the um, the Amer um, American media market. You get to see the South um, South African media as well, too. So I would definitely like to know, like your perspective on like, you know, with, you know, what Raja um, said as well, like what would be your per current perspective on like, you know, you know, us receiving the actual vaccine? Um, I really just kind of, you know, wonder, you know, what they're doing, you know, in South Africa at the current moment. And, you know, are they kind of using us as kind of like the quote unquote guinea pigs and like saying, hey, we're just going to wait and see what America is doing right now. Because like, you know, a lot of people are kind of waiting as like using the guinea pig method and kind of seeing like, hey, you know, I'm going to wait till they they do it. And then I'm going to just kind of, you know, if they're fine, then I'm going to just kind of walk in and get mine done. So I would definitely like love to see um, hear what you think about it. So I'll, I'll circle back around to the question about media. Um, but I do want to say, though, I think that sometimes we we take um, the 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 comparison between this moment and the Tuskegee moment, I think a little bit too literally, right? So Tuskegee is a stand in for our for our most for our hundreds of year long relationship to the American medical establishment, right? And so and I think Tuskegee is the most recent and perhaps some of the, the, the details of which are the most known and most egregious, right? But, you know, the, the perfection of American gynecological science was done on enslaved Black women's bodies against their wills, right? Um, these research hospitals, Johns Hopkins, Duke University, I mean, they have these sort of sordid histories of allowing Black folks to die and using their bodies in the morgues without informing families or even attempting to find family members before they begin experimentation on black bodies right so the so i think that we i think it's when i say that this is not tuskegee i i mean that in a sense that it is beyond tuskegee right that that our skepticism is healthy and it's and it's not just our skepticism as Black Americans, as Black people in the U.S., I think our skepticism as poor people, as the sort of sort of global mass, is is warranted. Um, I might be the only, if I'm not, if I'm correct, the only person on the panel today that is quite skeptical about the vaccine. Um, I would like to say though that I'm not I am not anti-vaccine in an absolute sense, but I am I am skeptical about the nature of this vaccine at this moment for a couple of different reasons. Um, the first of which is my own understanding of the process of informed consent and what I really see and understand to be happening right now is a public trial, 
right? Um, and so the, the is a public trial without actually informed consent, right? And so we have been made to believe, in some instances, we've even been guilted, right? I don't know if you all seen the news story about some, some, some of the folks who were the descendants of people of the Tuskegee experiment trying to explain to us that that was a different thing. So now that you actually have access to the medication, you should take it. I don't think we have to take the bait one way or the other. I'm not telling anybody what to do. But I do think that we it, we owe it to ourselves to respect our skepticism and, and know that our skepticism actually comes from um, historical memory. And it comes from a, a, a particular kind of continuity with the way we exist, not only in American society, but, in, but around the globe, right? Um, I think the other place that my skepticism comes from with the US is that the US has sort of, as early on, bought up the, the vast majority of supplies to work towards a vaccine, right? We are in the midst of a global pandemic. The answer to treating the COVID vaccine cannot, it cannot stop at the national borders of any one country. And so the, the US could effectively eradicate COVID, but if it's not eradicated in Mexico, Canada, Jamaica, we're not doing scratch, right? And so a part of the, my concerns come from the fact that places like Cuba, um, they have they have some fairly successful trials that have been running for quite a while. Um, but because of the U.S. blockade against Cuba, a lot of the the sort of momentum and impetus to do, to to develop the vaccine has been blocked, right? And Cuba has a long history of a of a sort of global medical diplomacy program that actually demonstrates a care for life, right? And so my, my concerns about the, the COVID vaccine in the US context is that I think it is, it is primarily an economic venture. I think people are concerned about taking the vaccine so that they can allow people to get back to business as usual. And I don't, and I personally don't think that business as usual is what any of us need to get back to because business as usual was not serving us prior to this moment. Um, and so like for me, I think that, and also even the way we understand, right? So like there is a lot of skepticism about how quickly the vaccine came about. And I know sort of the responses to that are that this was a sort of all hands on deck thing. Millions and millions of dollars have been poured into this moment. But the thing about vaccines is it's not just the development of the anti, it's not just the development of the medicine. It is also the long-term, the longitudinal studies and the observations of what the long-term effects of the vaccines are. And that's why you need, on average, six, seven to 10 years to study a vaccine. And so for me, without having a, a sense across a, a multitude of populations, across a longer sort of period of time, um, what the sort of impact and ramifications of the vaccine are, it's not enough to convince me at this point, particularly given that everything we know about the vaccine at this moment says that it doesn't necessarily protect us from getting it, it doesn't necessarily protect us from spreading it. Only thing, the only thing that they promise us at this moment is that it lessens the severity if we contract the virus, right? And so for me, that's not enough to convince me at this point. And so the last thing I'll say, just kind of coming back around to your um, question about media, um, I mean, the thing is, everyone is sort of <laughs> everyone is dealing with the vac. I mean, sorry, the the virus in in its sort of own time, right? So, he, you know, here in South Africa, just in December, um, the sort of that the newest strain mutated in South Africa, and there was there's been a sort of secondary kind of um, a secondary lockdown. We're at lockdown level three. Um, I was scheduled to come home. I was actually scheduled to come home today. But because the secondary strain uh, mutated in the UK and in South Africa, my flight was canceled. And so then I had to rebook elsewhere. And so, and, so and this is why it's also inherently political, right? Because the, U because the UK decided to exit the European Union, that then created constraints about movements from, from Europe, from the UK to the rest of Europe. And then this has a sort of global domino effect, right? So for, so for me, I'm really more interested in the sort of political questions about what it means to actually treat this as a global pandemic and not a sort of individual national issue and also not primarily as a money-making venture, right? As a life-saving venture. That's what I'm interested and concerned about. Good, um, good points. Definitely a lot of good points. Um, I've, I've visited Cuba and definitely did some um, some tours in regards to the uh, hospital and stuff like that. And I've definitely um, always wondered why we haven't kind of like crossed that Cuban embargo in regards to like bringing some of their doctors here to kind of like give us a global perspective because like the rest of the world is definitely giving 
I mean, it's getting Cuba's enlightenment. And I think, you know, we as a country could definitely benefit off of that as well, too. Um, in regards to like, you know, the the it being like a world, you know, epidemic and like, you know, people doing research in regards to the vaccine. I really think like, Dana, if you can give us some enlightenment about like kind of like, you know, just the just kind of the the whole like vaccine trial, like research methods, because like I'm just like kind of um, like uh, Layla just said, I'm, I'm kind of like skeptical about like the whole the process. Um, so I know like, you know, clinical trials and everything like that. Just can you kind of give me and the and the audience as well um, just some a couple words on that as well yeah so um first let me say like um i don't want to make it seem like the skepticism is not valid like um i understand um where the skepticism is coming from i understand why we are skeptics right but i also um I also believe that the way to debunk the skepticism is through education, right? So that's that's what we're doing, educating um, in comparison to, I know, like like you said, Layla, the Tuskegee experiments was not the end all be all, but even going back to slavery and even up until now, like I know when a lot of people go into the hospitals, maybe with like their parents and things, even today, we are not certain, certain people are not educated enough to ask the right questions you know when when they read the informed consent they don't really you know they can't really digest the the information you know the way that i could digest the information and that skepticism is all 100 percent valid and that's what these platforms are for that's what this conversation is for um so as far as it being um a public health experiment um i can I don't know if I totally agree with that because the um, the clinical trials were conducted, right? There were thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were a part of these clinical trials. Any type of medication that any of us have ever had down to the vitamins that we take, anything that has been FDA approved has gone through clinical trials. Now, granted, I do agree with you when you say like we haven't been able to see the ramifications of you know the the long-term effects that's a fact but i feel like at this point in time we have to you know weigh the pros and cons of of um the long-term ramifications and the here and now right so even with like the um the flu vaccine like most vaccines um when you're given to them that's why we have to get them um once a year or you know, however often, because those affect the 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 vaccines, the antibodies that you produce, they don't stay in your system forever, right? So we have to get titers, we have to get those um, vaccines yearly. So I think we can kind of um, be a little weary when we discuss the long term effects, because after a certain period of time, you know that vaccine isn't in your system, um, like. Um, it, it, it just depends on how long. And I think we talked about it yesterday, Kendra. I think we said about two years for the um, for the COVID vaccines. They're saying that we should um, get them every two years. And I mentioned yesterday, yesterday when we were um, talking before the program, I think COVID is something that's going to stick around. Um, I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, uh, I, I think it's going to end up being like a cold flu and COVID season. So I think the vaccine is something that we're going to have to um, start getting more often, um, but I don't, um, I do, I do want to talk about how um, you mentioned the whole economic venture um, and the vaccine being for the economy, and I 100% agree. I believe that the economy needs to get back rolling, right, and I'm not here to, you know, talk about the economy or politics, but we got to, you know, face the facts, right, like we gotta, the world, not just America, the world has to get back moving. Granted, I do think um, once the vaccine is solid here, I do think that it needs to be dispersed. I do think that there needs to be um, global collaboration with the vaccine. Um, and I think we probably could have gotten to this point even faster if it was more um, global collaboration. But the reason why we were able to get to this point so fast is because all hands were on deck, right? There were people from 
across the whole nation in their labs working 24 hours a day um, trying to come up with this vaccine. Not to mention the mRNA vaccines, like people work on this stuff and were working on these things in their labs before COVID even came into play. Like the mRNA vaccine was something that people were already thinking about. It was just COVID was the time for them to be able to say, hey, let's do this, right? So it's not necessarily a whole new thing, um, but when you have billions of dollars put, it, put into the research, you have thousands and thousands of hands, you know, it's like all these brains and all these hands, that's how they were able to, you know, get the, get the vaccine out. And not only that, um, the people who were in the labs and the doctors who are treating these patients, they are pro-life, like you said, like they are the ones who could, I mean, they care about the economy, but their purpose is to help the masses, right? First of all, do no harm, right? Kendra, like that, that y'all take an oath to do that. Um, so I feel like you have to be kind of weary when you're walking that line, talking about the, the research, the vaccine and the economy, because I get it, but you know, it's a very fine line. And as far as um, the, the vaccine, um, lessen the severity, but us still being able to, you know, get COVID, that's exactly what we're trying to do, right? That is exactly what we're trying to do because COVID is killing us and it's killing Black people um, at a faster rate than it is um, other, other ethnicities because we have more comorbidities, because we don't have the access to health care. Um, so that's exactly what we need to do. We need to um, let people know that when you get this vaccine, um, yes, you still may be contagious. That's why they're still saying we still need to wear our mask. Um, and I think masks are just going to be something that, you know, probably for the next few years, it's just going to be the norm. Um, but I think lessening the severity of COVID, that should absolutely be our number one priority because um, my husband, he works in the ICU, right? And he has patients on top of patients, on top of patients all day, every day. Um, he can't even barely take a lunch break because they're overwhelmed. So if we can, you know, stop the hospitals from being overwhelmed because the, the, the disease is less severe, severe or you're not, you know, having the symptoms, I think the vaccine is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, but, and Kendra could talk more to the herd immunity, um, if, if we don't get to that point of herd immunity, um, then the vaccine, you know, how, how good is it, right? And I'm not as much of a professional on herd immunity, so I'll let, I'll let Kendra talk about that. I was just about to just kind of tell Kendra, just going to chime on in because it's like, you know, just medicine. <laughs> Well, so I definitely, um, so, so, so before I get there, I do want to make sure that we do hit on um, the, how the vaccine works, um, it being an mRNA virus versus um, not being a live um, virus. So Dana, if you don't mind, just kind of like briefly discussing like exactly what happens when this vaccine enters into our precious body. Right. So um, most vaccines, well, vaccines that were used to, um, they call them live attenuated vaccines. So it's the it's the virus, but it has DNA in it. So, but it's it's not going to make you sick. Um, but sometimes I know people when they get like the flu shot, um, you end up getting like some flu symptoms. And for anybody who has any type of symptoms after you're getting vaccines, like a fever or something like that, my response is good because your body is doing what it's supposed to do, right? Whenever your body, whenever something foreign enter, enter, enters your body, the first thing you're going to do is mount an immune response, right? And a fever is letting you know that your body is working. Hey, something foreign is in my body. What's going on? Um, but with the COVID vaccine, it's the mRNA vaccine. So um, little science, little nerdy. There's something called the central dogma of life, right? So you have DNA that transfers to RNA that goes to protein. Everything in our body functions because of proteins, right? So they're skipping the whole DNA part. So the, this uh, COVID vaccine, what it actually does, it introduces your body to the spikes 
proteins that are on the outside of the of the COVID virus. So it's not introducing the entire virus to your body. It introduces just the spikes on the outside of your body. So your body then produces the antibodies to be able to target these spike proteins. So you're not getting the virus, just the spike proteins, right? But what it does, it causes your immune system um, to have memory. So we have memory cells. So the next time that your body is introduced to COVID, so like Layla was saying, you can still get COVID. However, your body is like, hey, that's COVID. Let me attack it. You're not going to have any symptoms. So that's pretty much how um, this vaccine works and how it's different. Um, it's not going to be integrated into your DNA. It's strictly um, RNA, the protein, producing those antibodies, causing the immune response, causing those memory cells to be able to attack the virus the next time your body is introduced to it. Yeah, I definitely think it was good to definitely touch on that because that, that, that is a huge difference in the vaccine now and uh, prior vaccines. But in general, coronavirus has been around for years. Like that, this, this is a, a group of viruses that do commonly infect animals um, and, and also humans. But what we have seen is that some of them that infect animals can evolve and then start to affect humans. So. Usually coronavirus um, will cause your typical flu-like symptoms, fever, cough, chills, muscle aches. Um, we also saw a, a form of coronavirus when we had SARS in 2003, and then MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, which we saw in uh, 2012. Um, so just to touch up about how the vaccine was made quickly. So we started on these vaccines with SARS in 03 in 2012. We didn't get far because you know, SARS at that time wasn't sexy enough. It didn't last long, you know, like we, I think it killed about 800 people and then it was gone. Um, I think that the MERS vaccine, it, get, it did get past phase one trial, but that technology was there. Um, so generous uh, COVID-19 first appeared about the end of December um, in Wuhan, China. And it was, it's believed that it was uh, from an outbreak in um, animals at a seafood market, hence why it was first infected in animals and then infected in, in humans. Um, the end of January, 2020, the World Health Organiz Organization declared a global um, emergency. Um, and so typically cars, cars uh, coronavirus, like most traditional viruses are spread uh, through direct or indirect contact. Indirect being you touch the surface of something that has the virus on there, you touch someone's hand that has the virus on there. Um, direct contact can be droplet or aerosols. And the difference in the, the difference in those is really the size of the viral particle. Is it a bigger part, a bigger diameter or a small diameter? Um, so we've mostly seen uh, COVID-19 being transferred through droplet precautions, sneezing, coughing on someone, even singing or chanting or things like that, which is why we saw um, an increase during some of the peaceful protests. Um, so aerosols we have are more so known if you're doing a medical procedure uh, like intubation that produces these aerosol droplets. Um, usually the virus can be detected about one or three days before you show symptoms. Um, However, there have been asymptomatic carriers that have been known to have exposure. And, and a, the difference between an asymptomatic and symptomatic is simply, do you have symptoms? And like I said, those symptoms can range as mild as a fever and a cough to very severe requiring mechanical ventilation, such as intubation. Um, we do see that people of color and people with comorbidities have a higher likelihood of not only getting the virus, but have poor outcomes. These comorbidities are age. We've seen over 65 be more likely to have the virus and there's a higher percentage of cases. Um, and comorbidities, diabetes, heart disease, um, lung disease, uh, immunocompromised states, and even pregnancy. We've seen these people have uh, poor outcomes. Um, like most viruses, a way to prevent this is um, washing your hands, right? for 20 seconds, <laughs> um, avoiding contact with any open orifice on your body, your eyes, your nose, your ears, and then, you know, staying home when you're sick and then wearing the mask. When COVID first started, there have been some postulated uh, treatments, and I think it started with uh, zinc and azithromycin and uh, plaquenil, which we see uh, 
treated in patients with lupus. Um, there were not a, a large group of randomized controlled trials to say that this was a, a true treatment for COVID. But as of late, there have been some antiviral medications and some monoclonal antibody uh, treatments that have been known to help lessen the severity of COVID. Um, so really it's, you know, when we look at it and we look at, you know, when are we gonna get over this? How long was it gonna last? How, are we, how long are we gonna be in this quarantine or isolation state? And I think the first step was getting the, getting the vaccine um, and, be, and having it available. Um, when we look at what do we need to do to reach this herd immunity, and basically herd immunity just means a large group of patients in the population have either got a virus and recovered and have a natural um, immune response, or they have been vaccinated against that virus and they have an immune response such that any other person in the population is no longer going to be affected and they're by ultimately decreasing the severity of disease. Unfortunately, we don't know the number that we need to reach herd immunity with COVID, but on average, epidemiologists do speculate between 70 and 80%. Um, so what does that mean? Would we get there? And I think if we look at it from just a population standpoint, if we need 70% of uh, the population to be um, vaccinated and about 60% consist of um, white individuals, and there have been some tracking studies that have shown about 68% have agreed to get the vaccine. So that puts us at like 42%, we're not there yet. And then African-Americans uh, consist of about 13%. And that same study speculated that 32% said they would decline the vaccine, which leaves us at about 6%, so we're not there. Um, and so number one, it's important to think about African-Americans should be vaccinated because we are at a higher risk of getting the vaccine. We have poor outcomes, um, but also decreasing um, COVID in the community also, as Dana had mentioned, will decrease the healthcare burden. Um, and I think as from an economic standpoint, I think people going back to work and now they can provide for their families. And so there was a comment about um, the, the goal was uh, this should be a life-saving venture. And I think with the vaccine, as Anna said, decreasing the severity of a virus decreases the number of hospitalizations, decreases the number of deaths. Currently, as of today, in the U.S. alone, we've had over 300,000 deaths and about 92, uh, 92 million have been um, infected. And so I think decreasing those numbers is a life-saving venture. Um, so again, I don't sway a person one way or another because it is new. Um, we do not know uh, long-term side effects. We do not know if it does decrease exposure, um, but we do know it does lessen the severity. And I think in order for us as a, a group, as an African-American community to become less skeptical is that we have to be honest in, 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 in these terms and not, uh, make you believe that, oh, this is going to, you know, we're never going to see this again. I think we do have to be honest uh, when we talk about the COVID vaccination. Um, and I know that there was a comment about pregnancy. That's like been a huge topic. And unfortunately, in the Moderna and the Pfizer biotech vaccine, which are currently the two vaccines we have available, um, there were no pregnant women in the studies. Um, and these studies had over I think 80,000 patients, but none of them were pregnant. Well, I think one did get pregnant during the study, but there were no um, enrolled patients that were pregnant. So we do not know anything about the COVID vaccine and how, and how it affects pregnant women. But what we do know is that it is an mRNA virus. It does not enter our DNA and it does not change our genetic makeup. So we would conclude that the effects will be as similar to someone who is not pregnant or not, or, um, or lactating. It will be the same uh, risk profile. So that we can't say. There have been some animal studies, rat studies, uh, that do show that given the vaccine during um, uh, gestational stages, it did not have any effects on the peri, um, pre and peri and postnatal period or any um, embryo, it didn't change any embryo logical makeup of the fetus. Um, and a lot of our medicines have been done on animals due to, you know, risk of, you know, ethical issues and morality issues when it comes to testing human subjects. Um, so that is important that we do have those studies. Um, so I personally, I got the vaccine a week ago and I'm here <laughs> with you all. 
Um, I had very mild side effects. The only side effect I had was arm soreness. Um, it was very sore though, I will say, um, more than when I had the flu. But um, I think when you think about getting the vaccination, I think number one, no one should make you feel bad for not wanting it. Um, I think you need to have a discussion with your physician or your healthcare provider about the, about your personal risk factors because everyone is different. Um, and so I think you just need to be opening, open to um, listening to your provider, but also being comfortable making your an informed decision for yourself. It was great information. Um, just great information. Um, I uh, was just kind uh, of um, listening to all this and kind of just wondering, um, and let me just pull up some questions that I had also as well too. <laughs> um, but I was just kind of wondering, um, you know, I, I was actually kind of wondering about like, you know, in regards to the vaccine, I know one has like, like one shot versus the other one having two. Like, you know, I, I was kind of unaware of like, you know, the what was the difference you know i think the overall goal was to kind of cure COVID to meet um and the general population of the world um but like what's the difference you know and i'm just kind of wondering like what's the difference between the two so both the pfizer and the moderna vaccines those are both two shot vaccines um i want to say and i could don't quote me but i think johnson and johnson are working on a one-shot vaccine. Um, I do know there are um, other pharmaceutical companies that are working on the, the one-shot vaccine, but the reason for the two shots, um, uh, based on what I've read and based on um, the research, they're saying that the one shot doesn't give your body, um, you don't produce enough antibodies the first time. So it's kind of like when you get a titer, like a titer boost. Um, so they give you another shot so your body can produce more of those antibodies. Um, so if it is a two-shot process, you need to get the two shots. Um, they, I know they are doing some studies. Um, I think there was, I want to say the Moderna vaccine where somebody got half the dose um, and they still, um, they still had a positive response. So there are some studies um, that are going on about that. But um, just to get the verbiage right, the vaccine is not a cure for COVID, right? Um, the, you're not getting the vaccine to cure the disease. So it's not like, oh, I have COVID, let me get the vaccine. Just like Layla said before, the vaccine is to decrease the severity of the symptoms. So you can have the vaccine and still test positive for COVID. That's why we still need people to wear the mask. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like they're still doing research on the the one shot vaccine. Um, it'll probably come down the pipeline because, like I said, my hypothesis is that COVID is not going anywhere. Um, and I do think, um, to Layla's defense, the economy people are going to benefit economically from this. Pharmaceutical companies are going to benefit from this. So if they can, you know, develop a one shot vaccine. Um, I definitely think they're going to do that. I just I think wanted, it's important. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to make be clear about what I mean when I say the economy, right? Um, because I'm not just talking about people going back to work. Because other countries in the world have dealt very differently with the economy and their people as the the, um, the pandemic hit, right? So in places like Cuba and in Venezuela, there were guarantees about um, 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 people who were guaranteed payment from their jobs, who were guaranteed that they would not be fired from their jobs. There were moratoriums on evictions. There is universal access to mass health care. In, in, in the American medical establishment, health care is uh, what's what's the opposite of preventative? It's it's treatment oriented. And there are other and there are other um, the Cuban medical system is geared toward preventative community medicine, where people actually live in communities and interact with their doctors. So the doctors not only know the people, their bodies what environmental factors they're dealing with. So there, there, is a, there is a different approach that is much more holistic and, and getting the economy going is not just about sending people back to work because when there is a different understanding of, of, of um, 
socioeconomic impetus, it's not just about do we send people back to work, it's actually do we guarantee people a right to a particular quality of life, which the US has never done for any of its people with the exception of wealthy white landed men. Right, so when I say it's about getting the economy well, I'm not talking about people going back to work. I'm actually talking about these people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk who have profited astronomically off of the death and destruction of us as a people globally, right? So I'm, I'm not just talking about jobs. And I think um, Elisa made the comment on Facebook, but it was posted here again. Um, she says, um, the high number of deaths was due to criminal neglect of mass population by the administration and non-existent healthcare infrastructure to suppress the virus. The vaccine, excuse me, is a step towards reducing hospital burdens, but I doubt it will solve it. There are other countries around the world that have minimal deaths, including Vietnam, China, Cuba, um, and that uh, it's important for us, like for me, the vaccine, my skepticism is that the vaccine, obviously, like you, we've all talked about what it does, but it's a stopgap measure that doesn't actually deal with what actually creates all of these pre-existing comorbidities in us as a people to begin with. The reasons why we're so much more vulnerable, it, there, there are so many other things that contribute to that. And that's why for me, I can never have the conversation about the vaccine it, it, just in relationship to the vaccine or COVID because there are so many structural inequalities that already make us vulnerable. And, and I think we do ourselves a disservice when we, when we talk about any of those things as individual entities. Yeah. And I definitely yeah. want to, oh, sorry, Dana. Um, but I definitely want to follow up with what uh, Layla was mentioning as far as the economy part of it and getting people to understand about to see the experiment. I mentioned how these African-American African-American men were sharecroppers, understanding that they were tied to land through debt, through this economic inequality that was perpetuated after slavery, right? To keep black bodies tied to land. And, and, you know, and they were taken advantage of because of their poor state, being sharecroppers. They were offered free meals and free medical treatment um, to participate in this uh, trial or experiment or study, whatever term you want to use for it, but it was definitely um, a way that the government and using uh, private philanthropists like Rosenwald during that time, he funded the uh, the beginning of this project for it to come about. Yes, syphilis was uh, a medical concern and it was affecting uh, African-American people, just like it was affecting all people, but in the way it has been used, you know, as Layla mentioned and other people, that is why the skepticism is there um, and is very valid because it has always been, when thinking about medicine and other aspects of the United States, we can't ignore uh, the capitalistic ties, you know, um, within that. We'll so, say, um, and in addition to that, I also um, want to make the point as far as um, I'm not sure the person's name who posted um, about the other countries around the globe having minimal deaths, including Vietnam and China. Um, as far as China goes, I can speak directly to China because my um, my advisor, he's actually Chinese and I had a couple of lab techs in China. I think what we, what we have to realize is the difference between America and China, right? Um, America, first of all, we're very entitled, right? So people tell us to wear masks. We like, I don't want to wear a mask because I don't want to. People tell you not to go outside. You like, well, it's my right to go outside. I can do whatever I want to. China was on lockdown. When I say lockdown, they had to be in their houses. Like they could not go anywhere certain people in certain zip codes, if they have zip codes, a certain group of people could only go to the grocery stores at certain times. And if you were found in the grocery stores at that certain time, you were put in jail. If you weren't on the streets, you were put in jail. America is not China. So I think we also have to understand the difference in um, how countries, different countries are ran in comparison to America. For the most part, America is a free country. We can pretty much do whatever we want for the most part, right? But when we're telling people like, hey, don't do this, they become a little apprehensive, right? So I think that has to do a lot with um, how 
um, how coronavirus was, was actually spread at such a rapid rate in America and how we, and, and the deaths become, the deaths are a result of the spread of the virus. Like if the virus was not being spread, people wouldn't be dying. Um, granted, I do think um, that the healthcare infrastructure um, had issues because this is something that they never seen before, right? They didn't really know how to handle it. So when you're getting something new, um, trying to figure out how to, you know, handle it, um, it takes time. And I think um, now um, the hospitals, even though they are run over, um, I feel like they are getting a handle on how to care for the disease. They're getting a handle on how to treat. Um, they're getting a handle on who gets this, who doesn't get that. Granted, that is a hard decision to make, but I think we have to be very weary um, in making comparisons between America and places like China when it comes to the number of deaths and how the, the disease was actually spread. Yeah, I definitely agree about that, about the differences in the countries. And then, I, I mean, I definitely do agree about the comment that the high number of deaths were due to, you know, neglect um, and non-existent health care structure. Because all these other countries, uh, for the most part, have a, um, you know, a more socialized med medical system in Canada, um, China. Um, and, you know, uh, there are pros and cons to that. But... Um, a lot of those countries, their health care structure is different than ours. And here, what we have seen in our health care structure is that people of color um, are usually a little are, are more marginalized than our white counterparts and um, affected disproportionately when it comes uh, to, to certain medical conditions. I mean, Black people are the highest at, at every disease process that I can think of. Um, you know, besides maybe certain genetic conditions that we see, you know, in, in our Asian populations. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, you do have to consider that. And I do agree, Layla, that, you know, we do have to change the way that we do think about just healthcare as a whole. Um, and I think it starts with, you know, ourselves being advocates for our own healthcare, um, taking care of our own selves, um, and definitely seeking medical attention when necessary. And I mean, fortunately, we do have certain government structures you know, in the United States and the Carolinas in general that um, have access, available healthcare to patients who were either underinsured or with no insurance. So I do think something that is gonna be a constant continued conversation to have. Um, as far as, there've been a lot of questions about the side effects of the vaccines. And I just wanna say that with any, study, any, any clinical trial, any study, there are going to be side effects. And unfortunately, we may not see some of these side effects until later on. That's just a fact. That's just how it works. Um, there was a question about death. The death is a side effect of everything. If I drink too much water, there is a risk of me dying, period. Like it's just a, a side effect of everything. Um, so I don't want to get, I mean, obviously you do want to consider the risk and have those conversations, but there are going to be risks. The majority of the risks of the COVID vaccine were very, were mild. Um, there was one case of a, a doctor who I think died. He had some low platelet counts and low white blood cell counts, but I don't know his pre um, existing conditions. Um, so you will see those side effects, but I don't want it to discourage because a lot of medicines that we take um, over the counter, a lot of vitamins that, you know, we like to take and, you know, the, I don't know, I can't think of, uh, I don't know, CoQ10s and the, um, you know, uh, uh, magnesiums and marshmallow root and, you know, there are side effects to these medicines. And I think we get, and I don't want to change times, but I think we get in, um, I think we get in our mindset that if it's natural, it's best. And that's true to a certain to a certain point, right? Whole foods are better than processed foods, but no medicines that you get in a bottle are technically natural because they're all made in a plant, in a lab, you know? Um, and they do come with, with side effects, you know, liver disease, kidney disease, kidney issues. Um, 
so I think thinking of the bigger picture as far as what we're trying to do with the vaccine, that being hung up, I don't want to say hung up, but being overly concerned about side effects because side effects are important to remember. But if you look at the studies, if you really look at the studies, the majority of the over 80,000 patients, the majority of the symptoms were your common muscle ache, fatigue, fever that you would get with any other viral vaccine. Gotcha. Um, so much good information right here, I'm telling you. Um, I actually have a twofold question, and then I think we'll try to kind of wrap it on up. Um, and kind of I want to um, have it geared towards like medicine versus historical backing. But um, in regards to the disbursement of the, um, the vaccine, um, you know, it, it seems like in the, you know, America, it's, it's general like levels to the disbursement currently right now. So um, I kind of just want to, you know, wonder, wonder from the uh, medical perspective, do you believe that we'll have the um, disbursement, you know, when do you think in general, when we're going to get a disbursement for general uh, purposes and also from a his, uh, historical backing since like we were talking about like a uh, business venture, um, like, could you kind of think it might be a, somewhat of a, a business scheme in regards to disbursement, the level of disbursement. So um, I just want to know your thoughts about that um, in regards to, you know, historical versus, you know, medical medicine as well, too. And after that, we'll try to probably wrap it on up. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think that we will have the vaccine as far as when the, the, the general population will have it, that I don't know. I do know, like, the, um, the ACIP usually develop, which is the advisory committee of um, immunization practices, they develop recommendations of how a vaccine should be um, distributed uh, to control disease. And that has to be approved by the CDC uh, director and health and human services. And so once they um, agree on the recommendations, then it's listed. And so right now we have different phases, uh, 1A, 1B, 1C. Um, 1A is healthcare workers and those who are 75 and up. Um, and live in long-term care facilities, so your nursing homes and things like that. And then 1B is um, your 60, uh, sorry, 1B is greater than 75. Um, and then 1C, the last is uh, 60 to 75, and then patients with comorbidities that I talked about earlier, diabetes, cancer, and even pregnancy. But if a pregnant woman is falls into the essential healthcare workers, then she can choose to get the vaccine earlier. Um, but I know personally, I know at the VA, we've had our um, providers have been able to get the vaccine, and we are now currently um, offering it to our 75 and up bureau patients, and then after that, I'm thinking maybe two months, three months, then we're still opening up to the other phases. Um, just, to, just to second what she was saying, I think they also, as of yesterday, I could be mistaken. I think they just changed the guidelines to like 65 and up. Um, so they're trying to like get more people vaccinated um, and, and another thing for another conversation, um, I know they were talking about like um, the production of the vaccine and um, holding on to those second doses. So I think now they're um, letting go, letting go of those second doses. So um, instead of, you know, holding that for the person who got the first dose, they're going ahead and giving those out and just producing um, more vaccine, which they were already doing anyway. I don't really know how I feel about that. I don't know if I feel one way or the other um, as long as production keeps going. Um, and I just want to, um, and this is a, probably the last um, comment we're gonna speak to and we can kind of like, I guess, have everybody give their last um, statement and we can kind of wrap it up. But um, somebody said from a political standpoint, other countries supported their citizens so they could stay at home whereas the U.S. sent out one-time payments and expected that to last a year. Y'all, we get it. <laughs> we get it. You know, we got the one-time payments too. Um, but at the same time, we, in, in the position that we are now, we're in now, we can't do much about that, right? So what we're trying to do is to educate. Um, educate you about history. Educate you about how um, black people um, have been um, put at disadvantages because of socioeconomic standings, because of lack of access to health care, um, because of lack of education. So we're here to educate. Um, we're not here to tell 
whoever um, is in the government that we need more money, even though we do. Um, I know we all, <laughs> all agree that we wish we were getting, you know, the same thing that Canada was getting, right? Like that, that kind of goes without saying. Um, but I think we just want to, like the title says, debunk the myth that this is the Tuskegee experiment. Um, they are not out here um, using the COVID vaccine and trying to um, get rid of the black population. They're not trying to infect us with microchips. We have heard all, I've heard all types of stuff. Like this is not that. Um, we have informed consent. Um, you, all the information is available to you. Like nothing, nothing is hidden. Um, the agenda is to decrease the severity of the disease, um, help stop the spread, help stop overwhelming the healthcare systems and try to get back some normalcy. And that's my piece. I, we appreciate y'all for listening. <laughs> so I, I, and I, I appreciate the say, panel. I wanna say also though, the, the question that comes to mind about informed consent is what is informed consent to an uninformed patient? Um, what is informed consent to an uninformed public? Um, and so for me, the my preoccupations about um, even the way the rest of the world is handling it, it handling the, the virus and the vaccine um, has to do with uh, an awareness of what else is possible. Because I think it, with within the scope of the US and particularly because everything we sort of see, read, consume only it, 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 it only allows us to navel gaze. We only think about ourselves as people in the US. And, and, and often US citizens do not, do not think about the rest of the world and the way the rest of the world are handling these issues, right? And so for me, it is, it is always important to, to not sort of become complacent in the state that we're in. Because if we do that, our lives will never improve. The state, the state of our being will never improve. So for me, I, I, I cannot stop the conversation that this is what we're dealing with. And I am here to say, yes, we need more money. I am here to say that we actually need to, we actually need to think, think, think differently about work, right? And so, you know, as a person who was fortunate enough not to have lost a job, not to have lost income, not to have lost health care, being able to take a step back for a minute it helped my mental health tremendously, which also impact, impacts our physical health, right? I mean, my father as a construction worker, like having, having time to sit still for the first time at almost 66 years old, having worked almost every day of his life, like that's, that's real. And I think we have to really take stock of what of what the moment of pause that, that COVID allowed us, we, like we can't just let that pass. Like we have to actually take stock of what that means and take advantage of that momentum. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, it, it is important to constantly be aware of the fact that yes, the, the US is a different country, but the US is a different country because we actually have a different socioeconomic logic. Like all of these things are connected. The, the level of rampant individualism is not something that's inherent to us. It's something that's taught to us. It's something that we are convinced of. And that if we don't actually do our duty and our responsibility in these moments to make it clear that something else is possible, we will continue to, to be to be sheep led to the slaughter because that's that's what's happening. Um, so I, so I, for me, again, as a non-medical professional, as a person who is studying this from a sort of social and cultural standpoint, I, I think there's so many lessons to learn in this moment. And, and to me, it's there's not a, it's not enough to just say, you know, well, this is what we have, this is what we have to deal with. Nah, like we're not gonna have a better life if we don't demand a better life, because they ain't giving it to us and they never have. So that will be my last word. <laughs> Just drop the mic on that one now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did anyone else have anything else to say before we just go ahead and wrap it on up? You know, I wanted just to follow up as far as like from a historical standpoint uh, to your question about what history tells us, right? Um, about this moment, about what we are to do. Um, and history uh, can tell us a lot of things. We can understand that the Tuskegee experiment um, was real. It was devastating. It was a racist experiment that had devastating effects. And one of those effects is the skepticism that Black people have when it comes to medicine. And that is real. What is also real is that we need African-Americans and Black bodies um, 
a part of studies. So we understand how it affects um, how diseases, how certain viruses, how medicine will affect the black body. And we have more of Afro studies um, that pertain to black communities. So we know what our future looks like down the road um, and far as those uh, um, those issues. And, you know, I saw one person mention about education. This is where it starts. And uh, Layla, you mentioned it. Um, people, you know, how do we give knowledge or make people understand uh, consent if they are already um, uninformed in the sense. And that's where we step in having conversations to talk about, you know, the fact that Yes, they created a penicillin, uh, created penicillin to get rid of syphilis, or they realized that penicillin was effective for syphilis, but you still can get syphilis if you do not take the uh, proper measures to protect yourself. Um, that is what we understand. That is what we know um, as well. And so as far as African-Americans and African-American community, yes, there's skepticism because we have always been treated last um, and overlooked when it comes to medicine and other aspects of African-American life. But I'm here to remind African-Americans and black communities that there are medical professionals, uh, people within your own communities who are doing the work, who are knowledgeable, um, they have always been there. Um, from Black doctors who were a part of, you know, medicine from the early 20th century up until, you know, uh, the Black Panthers organizing and finding health and establishing health clinics for African American communities, we have to do our part to educate ourselves. Um, and as much as there is blame to be point uh, pointed outwards because of uh, things that have happened to the African American community. We have to give ourselves credit as African Americans to be able to take uh, the autonomy that we have, the freedoms that we do have, and go out and pretty much save our own lives if we understand that we live in a country that won't do it for us. I definitely agree, and I'm glad I'm de I'm glad you made that point that we do need more African Americans in trials. Um, but then there's the skepticism because of past experience, so it's just a never-ending cycle. Um, and I think over I, I, this panel was I learned a lot <laughs> from this panel, and I think just as African Americans, we need to ask questions. Um, we need to advocate for ourselves. Um, don't take anything as the final answer. Always ask questions. And that's what I tell my patients. I'm like, you have to advocate for yourself because if you don't, no one else will. Um, and I think that is just an important concept to just keep in the back of your head. Advocate for yourselves and protect yourselves. Um, stay healthy. Like your mental health, as I mentioned, is important. Focus on your mental health. Focus on your physical health. Eat good food. Sleep good. You know, like these things also um, build up your immunity, protect you from infection. So don't forget about the things that you can do for yourself to make yourself um, a healthier person. Wow, y'all, like this is, this was just amazing. Like I really am just um, glad that we um, were able to just have a great conversation and actually just kind of debunk some myths in regards to COVID, actually inform some people, uh, enlighten people in regards to just the current situation that we got going on in the country. I mean, outside the country as well too, from a global perspective and historical perspective as well too. I definitely want to make sure we thank the uh, panelists. Um, definitely thank Dr. Brown, uh, Brown Vincent, Dr. Uh, Richardson, um, we got the future Dr. Um, Gant and the future Dr. Uh, Raheem, <laughs> you know, uh, we're going to go ahead and call that into, um, preach that to existence. So um, I just want to um, also just take um, the time to um, shout out the prevailing woman. Um, you know, this is definitely, um, you know, um, uh, a program that was definitely um, put on by them as well too. So we definitely want to make sure to um, shout out the um, the production of this event as well too. And also, last but certainly not least, um, definitely have to do this on my own. I definitely want to wish the um, these each one of these ladies a happy Founders Day. Um, you know, definitely uh, want to wish y'all a happy uh, Founders Day. Hopefully, y'all have many. You know, I, I you know hope y'all will have many, many, many more of them. And, 
definitely want to take my time just go ahead and shout y'all out really quickly but thank you all for coming out today hopefully this will be the first of many conversations that we'll have um in this group just to kind of you know like we said debunk some um, myths that we have so thank you all for coming out um and definitely uh, we hope to see you again thank you thank you thank you or is it it's the, are you supposed to silly smile or something like that game <laughs> this is our time okay it's, it's off facebook now What's okay <laughs> that was so good y'all yes that was that was so good y'all did that y'all did that Man. that was really really good i really enjoyed it i was like i enjoy myself yeah, I did. I learned so much. I enjoy talking to you. Are we still recording on the line? It's still blinking right there in my corner screen. I think we're recording, but it's, it's not just online. recording on Zoom. Okay, that's recording. Spring, you gonna send us? Can you send us the recording?